Is the West Bank security barrier good or bad? Jerusalem is beautiful, but an ugly structure cuts across the ancient hills. Depending on who you ask, it's a wall, or a fence, or a barrier. And depending on where you stand, it's either a necessary eyesore that protects the Jewish state, or it's a separation wall built to enforce an unequal system that allows one side to flourish while the other stagnates. For as long as I've been living in Israel, this thing has been here, winding across 434 miles of highly contested land. Most of it looks like this, an electronic chain link fence flanked by barbed wire and ditches, separating Israelis and Palestinians. But a fraction looks like this, 30-foot concrete slabs encircling big population centers like Jerusalem and Bethlehem. To live here, like my generation, we grew up in the Second Intifada. So I was a teenager in 2000 when the Second Intifada started. I was just 13 years old. So I never dropped from Bethlehem to Jerusalem, like what my dad used to do. It's one of my dreams now. So driving from Bethlehem to Jerusalem, this place is very close together. And his dad used to be able to do that. But now because of these walls that got put up, he can't drive across. It's a very short drive from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. Okay, remember, Bethlehem is where Jesus was born. Bethlehem is where, I believe, Rachel's. But for the first 15 years of his life, the wall didn't exist. And that's because it's a relatively new addition to an ancient landscape. Maybe you've heard about the Arab-Israeli peace process, a nice phrase for the long, torturous negotiations that will supposedly end this conflict once and for all. In the 1990s, it seemed that these negotiations were actually getting somewhere. The Israeli Prime Minister and PLO Chairman were shaking hands on the White House lawn, signing agreements that were meant to lead to autonomy and security for both sides. Okay, so think about this for a second. This is... In the 90s, these dudes were shaking hands. They were signing peace treaties. This is the leader of the Palestinian people and the leader of the Jewish people, okay? There was good things happening. And as of recently, there was progress to this. Saudi Arabia was uh, trying to sign peace treaties with Israel, right? The, the, the good things were happening, okay? And then it all kind of hit the fan. We who have fought against you, the Palestinians, we say to you today, in a loud and a clear voice, enough of blood and tears, enough. That never happened. In fact, things got worse. Today, this barrier is a visual reminder of the bitter divide between Israelis and Palestinians. How did it all go so wrong? How could peace talks end in this? Plenty of people on both sides supported the peace talks, but others did not. Some Palestinians viewed peace talks as a betrayal. Accepting a two-state solution meant accepting that Israel was here to stay, that the homes they left behind in 1948 some Palestinians. Why? Because some Palestinians don't believe that Jews have any access to the land, specifically the ones that support Hamas. So any compromise for them is a no-go. This is a lot of the super top types, okay? And there are some Jews that also feel just as strongly, okay? So it's not it's not uh, this side is, is only the extremist, this side isn't, okay? As, as you'll see, okay? So Palestinians were mad, Jews were mad because there was talks of peace, that the homes they left behind in 1948 or 67 were truly gone. Meanwhile, Muslims considered the And they did lose a lot of homes. And I got, I got Palestinian friends that their families lost homes that they had been on for hundreds of years, generations back. These are real issues. These aren't simple good guys versus bad guys stuff. But there was progress being made. And then, unfortunately, it all hit the fan. The land of Israel to be sacred Muslim land. And holy lands can't just be given away without serious discussion amongst right. religious authorities. Right. But the government signing peace agreements weren't religious authorities. And so, many Muslims rejected their authority to sign away any peace of the land. Ironically, many Israelis felt the exact same way. The peace agreements and the eventual two-state solution hinged on Israel giving up control of most of the West Bank. But that land had been part of the Jewish story for thousands of years. The prophet Joshua had conquered Jericho three millennia ago. Why? And this is what I'm saying. He said thousands of years. All of this, in terms of this conversation, is going to depend where you want to start the timeline. You want to start the timeline 100 years ago? Well, it's the land of the Palestinians. Only 5 to 10% of the folks there were Jews. You want to start the land? You want to start the timeline 3,000 years ago? Well, it's Jewish land. You want to start the land before that? Well, it was the Canaanites' land. Where do you want to start the timeline? Right? That, it, that's where this is going to come down to. Why shouldn't Jews get to live there? This is the land of our ancestors. Politicians shouldn't get to sign that away so easily. As Rabin and Arafat forged ahead, extremists did their best to tank the agreements. On the Palestinian side, Hamas and Islamic Jihad sent a clear message to the Palestinian leadership. We will never accept your so-called peace process. Their preferred medium? Suicide bombs. But their victims weren't Palestinian. They were Israeli. Meanwhile, Israel convulsed in protest. I so this is this is Benjamin Netanyahu, okay, and he is doesn't sound like he is with the Israel convulsed in protest. Okay, I'm saying this to the government of Israel, which is bowing down to this man. Okay, so he is not with the compromise here. Which 
We are here, for we will never allow Jerusalem to be divided. We'll never allow Jerusalem to be redivided. As the death toll mounted, some Israelis compared Rabin to a Nazi, cleaning his hands dripped with Jewish blood. They chanted. This is, so this is the, the, the Israelis saying this stuff about their own prime minister. In November 1995, a Jewish extremist made good on that threat. He lurked outside a peace rally where the prime minister had just finished singing Shir la Shalom, a song for peace. And then he shot him three times. Again, their prime minister, this is the equivalency of their president, was assassinated in 1995. So think about that for a second. Think about what JFK was to America and how long ago that was. And they had that happen in the 90s. Because, why? Why did this happen? Because they were trying to work towards peace with the Palestinians. Okay? So this did not happen that long ago. This is 30 years ago that they, that they had a public assassination of their president. Rabin died on route to the hospital. The death toll kept growing. Over the next five years, another 300 Israelis were murdered in terror attacks. And by the year 2000, the peace process was dead too. For the next five years, the region burned. Over 1,000 Israelis and 5,000 Palestinians were killed. Palestinian suicide bombers targeted Israeli civilians while they were boarding buses or eating lunch or shopping at the market. You, can, you cannot do this as a moral equivalency. When there are military operations and, and soldiers and terrorists get killed, it's totally different than when you're sending suicide bombers into civilian areas. This is the difference between Israel and Hamas. It's that simple. This is the difference between Israel and Hamas. Hamas goes in intentionally into civilian areas, suicide bombers, and Israel is sending warnings and notices ahead of time that you need to get out of there. So there's a huge, this is, these are not moral equivalencies. It doesn't, it, you, the situation in Gaza is terrible. It's awful what those people are going through is terrible. There are Christians there, right? There's Americans there right now. Not the same, not, 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 not a justification for terror. And if you think that, and if you think that's a justification for terror, you have brain worms. You need to get your head checked. March of 2002 was a particularly traumatic month. 12 suicide bombings killed over 100 Israelis. But it was the eighth of these bombings that scarred Israel for life. <laughs> Hundreds of guests, including Holocaust survivors, gathered for a communal Passover Seder in the Park Hotel. But there would be no celebrating that night. A Hamas suicide bomber disguised as a woman sneaked past security and entered the dining room with a suitcase full of explosives, killing 30 and wounding 140 more. Some of the worst pogroms of Jewish history had taken place over Passover. But this was the Jewish state in the 21st century. It was inconceivable, unacceptable, that Jews were still being murdered as they celebrated their holidays in their historic homeland. This and again, remember, the paradigm of the Jewish people after the Holocaust is never again. That is very common language. Never again. The Israeli government had to do something. Two days later, Sharon announced Operation Defensive Shield and the idea of cracked down on terror cells in the West Bank. For nearly a month, Palestinians lived under strict curfew. Even Yasser Arafat was trapped in his compound. That's crazy. The leader of the Palestinian people was trapped in his compound because they went in and they started cracking this stuff down. V. Price. 30 Israeli soldiers and nearly 500 Palestinians were killed during the fighting. Meanwhile, the Israeli government drew up plans for a so-called barrier wall, whose purpose was to keep terrorists from infiltrating Israel. So when you talk about the apartheid, two-state solution, different treatment of citizens, this wall was built from the Israeli perspective. You don't have to agree with it. And you don't even have to say what, what they did was right to keep the suicide bombers out. Now, you may say that's wrong. You may say that created apartheid, that created a two-class, that created racism, yada, yada, yada. Okay, the question that the Israelis posed to me when I went to Israel and said all of this to them, because I did that, because I actually understand what's happening there, is what would you have done differently if your civilians and your children and your family members were getting killed in suicide bombs repeatedly what would you have done to mitigate that threat? This barrier wasn't a new idea. In fact, before his assassination, Rabin had established a commission to look into the prospect of building a fence between Israelis and Palestinians. And this might surprise people, but in the 90s, it was the left that floated the idea of a fence. Because you see, a fence implies borders, a demarcation between two separate territories. And it was the left that pursued a two-state solution. Okay, now the left in Israel, remember the left in Israel, hear me loud and clear, the left in Israel is not the same as the left here, okay? Different geopolitics, different approaches, okay? The right in Israel is not the same as the right in America. The right in Israel is not the same as America. The right in Israel is not pro-life and uh, low fiscal spending. The right in Israel is pro-government and social welfare system because the right 
is has a huge constituency by the ultra orthodox Jews that don't serve in the military and that don't work. Okay, so the right there is pro ethno state. They want to make Israel as much of a Jewish ethno state as possible. The left in Israel wants a two state solution. So this this is important to note. The left had advocated for cooperating with the PA to define borders. The PA is the Palestinian Authority. But Sharon's government wasn't interested in that. After all, over 100 Israelis had been murdered in a single month. The defense minister insisted the fence was not political and not a border, but a temporary barrier for security purposes. So from the Jewish perspective, this, bar this barrier is for the protection. It's for security purposes, is to keep the suicide bombers out. The byproduct of that is now the Palestinians are going to exhibit a completely different life. They're going to ex experience a completely different life. And it's even worse for the people of Gaza because Palestinians, 200,000 Palestinians drive into Israel every day to work. 200,000 Palestinians drive into Israel every day to work. A lot of you guys don't know that because you, you've never been there. You don't know what you're talking about. It's trendy to say free Palestine. Yeah, a lot of them drive in, go work into Israel, right? Then there's areas that are both Palestinian and Israeli, right? Then there's areas that are just Israeli. More than two decades later, the structure is still here. And its critics argue that it can't be anything but political. So did it work? Are Israelis safer? No one argues with the stats. Between 2000 and 2006, terrorists from the West Bank carried out over 3,000 attacks within the Green Line, killing over 1,600 people. Over the next 15 years, that number fell by over 95%. I mean, those are pretty, pretty shocking results. You go from 3,000 terrorist attacks to 80? How do, you, how do you think you would feel when all of a sudden, over the next couple of years, the, 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 the civilian attacks drop from 3,000 to 80? How would you feel about that? You probably would be like, yeah, we got to keep this wall up. We got to keep the terrorists out. Unfortunately, that's at the expense of... Innocent Palestinian people that aren't all pro, pro Hamas, especially on the West Bank. They're not, the majority of the people there do not, the Palestinians there do not, are not pro Hamas. You know, it, again, when we say it's complicated, it's complicated. This whole like Israel is under, we're, uh, you know, occupied and stole land nonsense. Nonsense. And, and let's just say, let's just say for the sake of argument, it's true. What now? Let's just say it's true. Let's just say they stole the land. Let's just say the UN stole the land and just gave it to Israel on a silver platter. You want six million Jews to just bounce? Would you do that? If you have been there for multiple generations, would you just bounce? E even if I just if I entertain that nonsensical theory, would you do that? No, you wouldn't do that. So why so why throw these stupid Israel's just a uh, colonist? Uh, the, the British gave them the land and then then passed the, the, the bucket into the UN's hands and it was a big mess. So what would you do? But numbers don't tell the whole story. Uh -huh. And unsurprisingly, everyone's got a different interpretation of the stats. In 2006, an Islamic Jihad leader admitted on TV that the separation fence is an obstacle to the resistance. So you got the jihadis admitting that uh, w the fence worked? Interesting. And if it were not there, the situation would be entirely different. But security experts point out that the barrier is just one element of Israel's increased security, including the guy who built it. Dani Tilza is the barrier's chief architect, and he emphasizes that everything about Israel's security situation is complicated. It's impossible to point to any single factor as the reason for the reduction in terror. As he says, you can't just build a physical infrastructure without the necessary security activity around it needed to maintain it. In other words, the barrier doesn't work on its own. True security requires monitoring, right. actionable military intelligence, right. and even cooperation with the other side. Which is exactly what happened in 2005. After Arafat's death, the PA's new leader agreed to cooperate with Israel on security matters. And that might have had something to do with the reduction in terror as well. So what he just said is the reason why that number went from you know, 3,000 to, to 50 isn't just because of the wall. It was also because of mutual cooperation amongst the Palestinian. Again, this is why I think this is a good source for this sort of information. Shout out to Unpacked. But critics of the wall dismiss this argument. They claim that security is merely a pretext because the barrier isn't finished. In some places, it just stops. That's crazy, by the way. In other sections, huge gaps allow thousands of Palestinians to stream into Israel illegally every day, often in view of soldiers and cameras. So if the wall is about security, why would Israel allow these gaps? Well, depends on who you ask. For Palestinians, the barrier is a land grab, meant to reduce the size of a future Palestinian state. The International Court of Justice agrees, stating that the barrier was unlawful, designed to aid in the annexation of Jewish communities in the West Bank. Annexation, land grab, what does that mean? Let's break it down. The modern state of Israel has been around since 1948. Originally, the UN voted that it should look like this. But after a long and bloody war with most of its neighbors, it came out looking like this. So this is how the UN rolled out Israel to look, right? Arab and Jewish. They don't have they don't have Jerusalem in this, okay? They don't have Jerusalem in this. Now look at what happens 
when and how much they conquer. Neighbors, it came out looking like this. This is where the borders went. Now, does, does anything look interesting to you about this map? Those of you guys that know anything about this part of the world, does anything look interesting about this map? I, I think this is another country called Jordan in Syria. Uh, this is Egypt? Uh, what does that mean? Well, it, this isn't Israel today, is it? So what does that mean? That means that Israel gave back Egypt, Jordan, Syria, and a lot of these areas. Do, do, do you understand? Do you, are, you, are you tracking what I'm saying? So in the 1967 war, they got all of this land. They, they fought and defeated all these people. They were attacked again, fought, defeated all these people again. And what they do? They gave it back. But they kept a lot of the West Bank, and specifically, they kept Jerusalem. Because that was what they wanted. That's, that's, that's what they wanted. They wanted Jerusalem, as you would if you were Israeli. Punchline, this is against UN law. And that's where you start getting this language of occupation. That's where you start, right? Are you tracking? So from, 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 the, from the Israeli perspective, it's like, what are y'all talking about? We gave y'all most of the land that we took. We gave it back. We just kept Jerusalem in some, of the, in, in some of these parts for ourselves, right? But at the same time, you, there's this international law. Do you, do you understand how this gets complicated? And nuance. You're still violating some international laws by not giving all of it back. Because in international law, you can't just take that stuff. 19 years later, it fought another war. And over the course of six days, Israel gained this, and this, and this, and this, and this. The fact that all of that became Israel and they gave it back should give you a, a whole lot to understand of their, their mentality here. They, they take a lot, and from their perspective, like, look, man, we gave y'all back Egypt, <laughs> the whole bottom part, right? The Sinai Peninsula. We gave y'all back a lot of this stuff. What are y'all tripping about? We, we, we could just, we could take the whole West Bank if we feel like it. But, but we're going to give you guys back some of it, but we're going to go ahead and hold on to, 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 some, of, uh, to some of Jerusalem. We're going to go, go, go hold back to some of this land that we, we want to be ours. Again, I understand from their perspective. I also understand from the Palestinian perspective, who are like, they're pointing to UN, to the UN laws, to the international laws. You can't do this with, with it within international laws. Which made things really complicated. Because post-67, the Jewish state controlled the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza. Over a million Palestinians watched in horror and shock as Israelis streamed into land they considered theirs. Meanwhile, Israelis relished the chance to finally visit the holy sites they had been banned from for 19 years. It, 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 this, this is like, it sucks. It sucks for the, for the people that were there, Palestinians, the Arabs that were there. And then at the same time, would you have done something different if you were the Israelis? You just fought off all these, all these other Arab countries around you? What, are you just going to give it all back? You would probably keep some of it for yourself, too. The Western Wall, the Cave of the Patriarchs, Rachel's Tomb, sites that symbolize the Jewish people's ancient connection to their land. Remember, the, best, the, temple, the temple Mount is the holiest site in, 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 in the Jewish faith. Who controls the Temple Mount right now? Oh, so you mean they captured the Temple Mount and gave it back to control to keep the peace? Oh, you didn't know that part, did you? The Temple Mount is in our hands. But can it, can Jews go to the Temple Mount and pray now? No. The West Bank is the name that the Jordanians gave the area. But lots of Israelis refer to the West Bank by its biblical name, Judea and Samaria, emphasizing the Jewish link to the sacred ground. A Bar Ilan University archaeological survey has just found a small but incredible discovery. Two coins that date back some 2,000 years discovered in the Benjamin region of the West Bank. Israelis began establishing communities. So yeah, so, so there's... It's, a mountain of archaeological evidence that, that supports that that land was Judea and belongs to the Jews. A mountain. Communities and land they considered theirs by right, helped along by generous incentives from the government. Israelis who live in Judea and Samaria see themselves as natives returning after a long exile. But most Palestinians point to their own generational link to the land. They ask why these Jewish johnny come lately should have the right to build communities in disputed territory. Nearly 500,000 Jews live in the West Bank, and the number is growing, which brings us back to the... And, that, and, that, and that's a lot of the tensions as of late, is the settlements in these historically Arab neighborhoods and the Jews coming in and gentrifying these areas and the Palestinians not being able to get permits to build in these areas. That's a lot of the current conflict in the West Bank right now. Barrier. See, most of the barrier runs along the pre-67 boundaries that the international community accepts. Right. But in some places, it bulges outward to include large Jewish communities within the West Bank. And this is where it gets more problematic because the more extremist Jewish folks who do things like spit on Christians in Israel those folks are like, yeah, nah, we're going in. We're taking, we want the West Bank too. 
We don't give a crap what wall that we, we're going to go in and take this too. This is ours too. Israeli courts have blocked a few of these expanded routes because the more Jews live in the West Bank, the less likely it is that they'll ever, you know, leave. And that makes it complicated for Palestinians to claim that territory as part of their future state. Because as far as the Palestinian president is concerned, not a single Israeli would be allowed to live in a Palestinian state. For most, it's a zero-sum game. Palestinians don't want a single Israeli. Israelis want to take their land. They're going in. They're taking as much as they want. They're, they're, they're taking these historically uh, Arab neighborhoods. They're flipping them. They're making them Palestinian. Uh, they're making them Israeli neighborhoods. I'm telling you, it's 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 not it's not as cut and dry as as the hashtags want you to think it is. Any Israeli gain is a Palestinian loss. Any Palestinian gain is an Israeli loss. Right. It's a zero-sum game. And that's the mentality that has led some Jewish community leaders to insist that the barrier remain unfinished. Because once the barrier is finished, there's nowhere for their communities to grow. But the barrier doesn't present the same problems for Jewish communities as it does for Palestinians. The barrier cuts Palestinian communities and families off from each other. Communities separated by the wall have even begun developing distinct accents, as though they live in different uh, uh, yeah. countries, rather than just a few miles away. And this is terrible. This is, this is terrible when, when you have families that live on other sides of the wall that can't see each other. This is awful. And this is, this is the type of things that the Arab people deal with, that these Palestinians deal with in th this part of the world. And it sucks. And this is where the accusations of apartheid come in. Farmers who used to stroll out to their olive groves now have to apply for a permit to work their land on the other side of the barrier. That's crazy. Don't take it from me. Take it from them. First of all, we cannot reach the Jerusalem. Although Bethlehem near Jerusalem, we can near Jerusalem. But now we need more time just to go around the separation wall to reach uh, Jerusalem. And uh, of course, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which has, which is very uh, important in our religion. The barrier turns a previously smooth commute into an arduous journey across right. checkpoints. Right. The road from Jerusalem to Bethlehem only takes like half an hour. But because of the checkpoints, the walls, uh, it takes me two hours a day. In short, Palestinians within the West Bank have limited freedom of movement. Right. They feel effectively trapped behind a barrier. Right. A constant, visible reminder that none of the promises of the past 75 years have panned out for them. Right. They envisioned a defeated Israel and a sovereign Palestinian state. But none of that has happened. The frustration is mutual. Again, remember, their, their thing was, we, we're getting these Jews out of here. Now they're frustrated. Now they are, they've lost morale. They're, they're broken. So what happens? Hamas rises up, says all this peace talk, all this living among, nah. We're going to turn up and we're going to do the terroristic stuff, right? So how, how do so many Palestinians support Hamas, right? The, they say the majority in Gaza, a little less than a majority in, in, in the West Bank, two different places, is, is because of this sort of stuff. These folks, these folks have lost hope. Because Israelis are still dying in terror attacks. 19 Israelis were killed in terror attacks over six weeks in 2022. March of that year, the IDF started reinforcing holes in the barrier, replacing old fencing with 30-foot concrete walls. Sometimes, it seems the solution is farther away than ever. But some are more optimistic than others. Rabbi Yehuda Cohen has been living in the West Bank for over 20 years, where he works with Jews and Palestinians to build a more just society. This is not uncommon, by the way. I just want you guys to know that. I know, I know you're getting a lot of this, like, hashtag, throw a, you know, a Palestinian flag in your bio, throw Israeli. It's a lot of folks in there uh, that are working to do stuff together. A lot of Israelis, a lot of Palestinians working to do stuff together. A lot of Israelis, Palestinians are friends, right? There, there, there's a lot of this stuff that happens. So this whole notion that we're just going to do it this way or that, like, it's, it's just, that's just not what it is on the ground. It's, it's substantially more nuanced on the ground than, than the folks in the West who are tweeting from the comfort of their home think it is. And though he doesn't have all the answers, he does have something that's just as important, hope. We do have to make peace with the Palestinians. And I would say that as daunting as that might sound, as, as hard as that might sound, I don't think Jewish-Palestinian peace is any less possible than reviving a dead language uh, back to life uh, and in gathering a broken and scattered people from the four corners of the earth back to the country we had been displaced from 2,000 years earlier, or even fighting the British Empire to free our land. I think all of those all of those objectives were probably a lot more difficult than the challenges we have in front of us today. So if we could do that, we could do this. Even within Israel, there's debate over the wall. Has it solved problems or created them? Has it made Israelis safer or just made Palestinians' lives harder? Mm. Depends on where you're standing. But one thing is certain, the wall is a symbol, a visual reminder of our divisions and our competing visions for the future of the land we share. Yeah, so anyway, um, I, I share that with you guys. Just, to, just, just so one, don't dehumanize the Palestinian people. Don't, don't, don't dehumanize them. Don't assume that everyone who's a Palestinian is a terrorist. Don't assume that everyone who's a Palestinian is anti-Israel, right? Um, this, 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 this notion is not helpful. At the same time, uh, don't think that God has forgotten about Israel and that God is done with Israel and that, and that they're not the real Jews. That, that's sick. 
That's anti-Semitic. It will not be tolerated here. We see, according to the Bible, that prayer is extremely important in terms of us being transformed from the inside out when we get aligned with God's will. I want you guys to implement these spiritual disciplines in your day-to-day -day life. And the only way I've been able to do this consistently is through writing down my prayers in a prayer journal that does a few things. One, it allows me to reflect and come to God humbly and ask him to move on my behalf. And two, it allows me to document my prayers, which ultimately helped me remember the very things that I was praying for and see the hand of God tangibly in my life when he answers them. So I would urge you, consider writing down your prayers. It could be in a blank notebook. It could even be on your phone. Or you could check out the one I personally designed and used from my own quiet time and spiritual discipline that I think would be a huge blessing. It's the exact structure and system that I've used for years to pray and be more consistent in my spiritual disciplines. And here's the thing, with the hope to create a prayer movement, we've made the PDF version of this prayer journal completely free. So to get the PDF of our prayer journal completely for free, go to blessgodpdf.shop 